We hope you will join us during Common Hour next week for our in-person Common Hour event, What to Expect from the 2022 Elections, featuring Stephen Medvick, the Honorable and Mrs. John C. Kunkel Professor of Government, and Burwood Yost, Director of the Floyd Institute Center for Opinion Research. The event will be held in Lisa Bonchek Adams Auditorium. During today's event, Zoom viewers can submit questions for our speaker via the Q&A feature. Please indicate your affiliation with the college, but we do not need your name. After Common Hour today, please stay on Zoom to continue the Q&A with our speaker, beginning at 12.40 p.m. And now I'd like to introduce Amelia Rouser, Senior Associate Dean of the Faculty and the Charles A. Dana Professor of Art History. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Common Hour and to the 2022 Mueller Fellowship, now in its 41st year at FNM. Following the visit of Mueller Fellow Masha Gessen several weeks ago, we're honored today to welcome Kevin Young, poet, essayist, editor, and director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. I want to acknowledge the generosity of the Paul A. Mueller family who have made the Mueller Fellow visits possible for over four decades. Established in 1980 by Judge Paul Mueller and his mother, the Mueller family has been synonymous with civic and philanthropic involvements in the Lancaster community for decades. And their generosity to Franklin and Marshall has enhanced our campus life enormously. Judge Mueller was formerly the college's attorney and both he and his father served on the board of trustees at FNM. Thank you, Paul, for making Kevin Young's visit possible. In 1981, the first Mueller Fellow was Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. Other Mueller Fellows have included Sir David Attenborough, David McCullough, Freeman Dyson, Thomas Friedman, E.O. Wilson, Spike Lee, Mira Nair, Frank DeFord, Steven Pinker, Nina Totenberg, Susan Laurie Parks, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, scientist and environmentalist Amory Lovins, author, poet, and activist Sandra Cisneros, pediatrician and public health advocate Dr. Mona Atisha Hanna, and last year, Judith Human, disability rights activist. We are indeed honored to add Kevin Young to the list of distinguished Mueller Fellows at Franklin and Marshall. He will be with us virtually throughout today, engaging with students and faculty. At 1240, following the Common Hour, Mr. Young will participate in a follow-up Q&A. If you're able to stay for this extended session, please keep your virtual site open. To introduce our distinguished guest is Carrie Sharon Wright, Senior Teaching Professor of English and Director of the Writer's House. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, uh, Amelia. Uh, welcome. Actually, I am co-introducing uh, our guest this morning, Kevin Young, with Miles Montalvo, who is a member of the class of 2025. So um, Miles and I have co-written an introduction and we're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, as you just heard, I'm Carrie Sharon Wright, director of the Writer's House at FNM and a senior teaching professor in our English department. Hello, I am Miles Montalvo, I'm an intended creative writing and international studies joint major. I also serve as the sole representative for FMN on the Lancaster City's Poet Laureate Committee. Um, and it is our great honor to co-introduce today's Mueller Fellow, Kevin Young. In my role as director of Writer's House, I have delivered over 750 introductions. Yet here I am before you, daunted. This is Kevin Young we are about to meet, the most generative poet of our time. Kevin Young, poet, author, essayist, editor, historian, father, archivist, museum director. Young is a polymath whose influence on contemporary culture makes all our worlds better. Formerly a professor of creative writing and English at Emory University, for four years, Young directed the Schumenberg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library transforming its archives with major acquisitions in Black literature, music, and art. Since 2017, Young has served as the poet editor of The New Yorker, whose poetry section he has again transformed with its touch of diverse poets and exquisite taste. 
Most recently, Young has named director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American Culture and History, um, where he is again manifesting his vision to preserve, honor, make legible, celebrate, and promulgate African American experiences and artistic genius. At the center of all this creativity, there is Young, the poet, author of 11 books of poems, two books of nonfiction, and the editor of 10 other books. Young's poetry is complex without being didactic, steeped in history, and yet always personal, lyrical, and musical. It shows his chops as a student of the lyric tradition, his immersion in jazz, hip hop, pop, rock, blues, and hymn, and his love for all of the stuff of contemporary life. I'm especially moved by how Young's poems give readers permission to see history working through us. There are times when I, rare times, I should say, there are rare times when I hand a book to a student and I feel like I'm handing them treasure. Giving Young's books to Miles Montalvo felt exactly like that. As a poet and a person of color who recently has been struggling to reevaluate his own identity, um, reading Kevin's work um, led me into an emotional spiral. I found myself recounting past traumas, as well as finding a little bit of solace in Young's uncanny ability to take such serious issues, shrink them down, and then evaluate how he felt in that moment and how he feels in his reflection. Um, it was honestly deeply inspirational for me, and I hope that with your brief time at FNM, you can grace our audience and our many writers um, with that same form of inspiration. Please welcome Kevin Young. Thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. And it's uh, great to be introduced by uh, Miles and Carrie. Uh, it's such a special uh, moment to be here uh, and be the Mueller Fellow. That list of names is quite something. And um, I'm eager to uh, be here with you at Franklin and Marshall. I'm going to give a short reading and, and talk a little bit about my work. And then we'll have a chance to talk together. The first poem I'm going to read is a poem called Aunties. It's from a book called Dear Darkness. And it was a book that I wrote a number of years ago now that I was starting when it was really a book about Louisiana. And this is one of those poems. Uh, both my sides of my parents' family are from Louisiana. Um, but this is about the aunties in my family. Uh, and it's called simply Aunties. There's a way a woman will not relinquish her pocketbook even pulled on stage or called up to the pulpit. There's a way only your auntie can make it taste right. Rice and gravy is a meal if my late great aunt Tuda makes it. Aunts cook like there's no tomorrow, and they're right. Too hot is how my aunt Tuddy peppers everything. Her name given by my father for seeing her smiling in her crib. There's a barrel full of rainwater beside the house that my infant father will fall into, trying to see himself, the bottom. And there's his sister, Margie, yanking him by his hair grown long and superstition. Never mind the fly swatter they chase you round the house and into the yard with, ready to whoop the daylights out of you. That's only a threat. Onis will fix you potato salad and save you some. God mothers, God sends. Aunt smoke like it's going out of style, and it is. Make even gold teeth look right, shining, saying, I'll be John with a sigh. Make way out of no way. Keep the key to the scale that weighed the cotton, the cane we raised more than our share of, if not them then who will win heaven? Holding tight to their pocketbooks at the pearly gates, just in case. I thought I'd read another slightly older poem, uh, which is from a book called Book of Hours. And in Dear Darkness, um, my father died in the midst of writing that book. So poems that in Dear Darkness that were just memories of going to Louisiana every summer and for Christmas and holidays, uh, suddenly became elegies without a word changing. 
Um, but I and I wrote some elegies in Dear Darkness for him. And then I wrote a book that was very much about uh, the moments, the days, the hours uh, after he died called Book of Hours, H-O-U-R-S. But I suppose it's also a book of hours of um, my family, but also I think thinking about grief for all of us, uh, as well as birth, um, which appears in, in the middle of the book. But this is from the end, it's called The Mission. Um, it's set in San Francisco in the Mission District where I used to live. Um, and it mentions Emily Dickinson and ends with a line from hers. The Mission. Back there then I lived across the street from a home for funerals. Afternoons I'd look out the shades and think of the graveyard behind Emily Dickinson's house, how death was no concept, but soul after soul, she watched pour into the cold New England ground. Maybe it was the son of the mission, maybe just being more young, but it was less disquiet than comfort, days the street filled with cars for a wake. Children played tag out front while the bodies snuck in the back. The only hint of death, those clusters of cars, lights low as talk, idling dark as the secondhand suits that fathers or sons, now orphans, had rescued out of closets, praying they still fit. Most did. Most laughed despite themselves, shook hands and grew hungry out of habit, evening coming on again. The home's clock broke like a bone, always read three. Mornings or dead of night, I wondered who slept there and wrote letters I later forgot I sent my father, now fine buoyed up among the untidy tide of his belongings. He kept everything but alive. I've come to know sorrows, not noun, but verb, something that unlike living by doing right, you do less of, the sun is too bright. Your eyes adjust, become like the night. Hands covering the face, its numbers dark and unmoving, unlike the cars that fill and start to edge out. Quiet cortege crawling half dim till I could not see to see. That's from a book called Blue Laws. And that's my grandfather's fiddle on the front there. And then I thought I'd read from my most recent book, which is called Stones. Um, these are all Legos and various pieces of plastic that washed up on a beach in England. Um, uh, they're part of the flotsam of daily life. And in some ways that's what the book is about. It's about um, a more permanent kind of memorial, these stones that um, grace two graveyards in Louisiana where uh, my kin are buried. And I thought I'd just read around in it. Um, this first poem is called Halter. Halter. Nothing can make, make me want to stay in this world. Not the grass with its head of hair turning gray, not the swayback horse in the field. I swear I almost saw start to saunter nor the bent shadows late in the day, drawing close the neighbor's boat, not yet docked, gathering snow. Not the dream with the moose hunched in its crown, shedding velvet led by a silver halter through the shaded campground, a shawl over its shoulders like a caftan on a grandmother or her rocker whenever she's no longer there. Not the brass nail heads on the Adirondack chair I put together, sweating this morning, that creaks but still does hold, nor the cries of the others above water, beloved bright voices of summer, echoing like the ice cream man in his whirring truck. Along the curb, his lights flash like an ambulance, playing the tune you cannot name yet know, except this babbling, like a light barely shining from below the baby's cracked door. This is called egrets. Some say beauty may be the egret in the field who follows after the cows 
sensing slaughter. But I believe the soul is neither air nor water, not this winged thing, nor the cattle who moan to make themselves known. Instead, the horses standing almost 15 hands high, like regret they come most of the time when called hungry. The grays eat from your palm, tender tooth, their surprising plum dark tongues flashing quick and rough as a match, striking your hand, your arm, startled into flame. This is called clearing. It's a strange place to try and find God inside a building. Better off in a field whose owner, if any, has let the ivy overtake it. Shotgun shacks pulled down, abandoned beneath the green that has no borders and thus is beautiful. Once seen, you won't later in shadow be able to hunt it down. That meadow, we sat a while, unbit, shadeless, then went on without. Um, once a year or so, um, we go back now and, um, I usually go back with my son who in this book is, is quite young as you'll hear in a later poem, but sometimes I meet my mother, uh, there. And this poem is about a time being down there and, and, uh, a conversation we had, but also, uh, again, these stones, these gravestones that are, uh, always there in some ways. It's called dog tags, which as you know, are the things, uh, uh, Folks in the military wear around their neck uh, with their names on them. Dog tags. Of us, there is always less. The days hammer past, artificial daisies at the grave. Words I didn't choose from my father's headstone and those that came instead to live around my neck. Dog tags, a tin pendulum on my chest. On my mother's side, my cousin, too young, Top dirt a pile above her, but no stone, nothing but the tin foil name from the funeral home, the fresh plastic flowers that still wilt in this heat. At Blackjack, she lost everything my great aunt and uncle had saved, even their low ranch where I first knew blue glass, plastic covering the rug and the good couch in the sitting room. No one dared sit. The prickly underside of the clear runner, a cactus, you couldn't help but touch. Uncle Wilmer's pickup, long paid off, now stares empty under somebody else's tree. The liars and book cookers came with their knives, offering her seconds, and she sat and ate. Once you've tasted the stone-filled fruit of the underworld, you may never return. They took everything from her, my mother says, both of us shaking our heads, disbelieving how exacting death is, how deep the shade, except breath. She was in debt and dead within a year, went through money like water, and that didn't last long either. So um, one thing about the um, places in my home places, I should say, in Louisiana, is that often there are dirt roads and, and, and uh, many of them didn't get names till recently. And this poem's about that. Uh, one of my aunties, if not a couple, appear in this poem. Or I should say reappear. Sandy Road. The roads here only lately got names. Before we lived on rural route blank, the mailbox far enough away across a field, it was worth a trek only once a week to find what the world had to say. It's metal mouth of garfish, few found. No streets, just this rushing stream after a hard rain. Today, the roads remain mostly ditch water and dirt, small stones that migrate, but never far. Today, my auntie complains the roads were named for grand nieces born yesterday who didn't do nothing, 
instead of after great grandfathers and others who cut their way back here by hand and hatchet, wheelbarrow and know-how, trucking even daylight in. These are our saints, our Emiles and Adams and Banans who made these roads right as rain. We still live in their straightaways and curves, slowly buying back what so-and-so's foolishness fretted away. Once the whole doggone world was young, once there were no words for things, and people had to wait among the green and listen first, making sure the things themselves, the very stones, would tell you what they wish to be named. Mason jar. Most miracles be small. Lightning bugs flicking off and on in the dusk before the storm, hoping to be caught by fire and each other. Instead, children capture them winking in jars once filled with pennies or peaches put away for winter. This waning light they drown in without the air they are meant for. In this heat, little keeps. See how your hat wilts, hand held over your heart to honor today the dead who cannot say, yet still share your name. Like I said, my son was little. He's now 16 in this book. So I thought I'd read one about him. Lilies, almost June, yet the blooms are already done here among my grandfather and foremothers and my father planted too early. We miss you, brother. He will not see another May whose colors fiery surround us and now him. Will not know his grandson and namesake ever since cruel April stole him. Father, never will you know how words blossom from my son this Memorial Day visiting your stone. Hot up more more he sings the lilies we leave will tip over in wind near your name my son doesn't yet know though it's his own i'll just read a few more this is called balm like not like lip balm, but a more interesting bomb. Balm. Everything is everything. What all can be known? These are the graves my dead have sown. Each year they grow, gather rings like trees till I can't count no more. Beneath their shade I cast about. It is what it is. Above in the blue, the moon cannot be seen yet shines. The really it casts no light, just mirrors the suns back down among us. The stones keep me like bees or a brother. What balm the weather offers. Fireflies are neither. All night they try finding each other lightning bugs who beacon and beckon the mason jars we kept them in as children, or just what did them in. The end has no end. Here the names of the dead cannot all be read, only understood. Beneath this stand of pines, I'll make mine, keeping what all I find. The moon barely visible in the blue of daylight's brine. Is this where I'll be buried to see you when I see you? And I'll end with just two more. This one's about autumn. It's called Russet. I want to drink the day down. Maybe next the night. First, we'll find our feet, our feet the floor. The blue beyond the window returns like a mother after work collapsing into the living room. I'm home. 
I'm done being in love with what leaves. Autumn gathers in the trees, russet, then tries not to fall asleep on the cold ground. God, it is hard being happy if you try. Instead, be like the slow yellow. Let go. And I'll end with this poem called Rapture. It um, is kind of a true story uh, in that the friend in the poem this really happened with, and uh, it inspired me to think about um, resurrection and the end of things, which I guess that whole book thinks about, but um, this is a poem that, that makes that pretty directly about that. It's called Rapture. I wanna be awake when the world ends. I wanna be my friend who rose to an empty house, even his grandmother and her worn cross gone and thought it was the rapture that he hadn't crossed over. Let me rip my shirt as he did and tear into the street, hollering. Let me hear only my blood beat this morning in the rain before the dawn. No one on the line. Later, when they return, let those I love who left have only gone to the store, running errands this errant, unebbing life. After, let what I've torn, the myself I mourn, be mended and start over like a scar or star. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that was just transporting. And uh, that was incredible. Oh my gosh. Yeah, really incredible. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, Miles and I had the job of asking you a couple of questions. And then we're going to open it up for questions from the um, wider group of participants. Terrific. Yeah, so um, I'm really conscious of the music in your poems. And so I just want to say that if I stutter, it's because I'm, I just want it to sound beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to give it over to Miles. He gets the first question. Oh, I get the first one. Okay. Um, I guess, and this, this might come across a little greedy, but... My first introduction to your work was um, in Stones, and it was the first poem, Resume. And I and I like to, I hope it's Resume and not Resume, you know, because <laughs> that was a little debate, but if we bring it up and it's actually Resume. But um, I kind of created this whole image where the poem was sort of you introducing yourself to us, but I think it was also kind of a commentary on the world that we live in where you know, you have, uh, being a person of color, you have to sort of state your credentials. And mm. I thought it was sort of playing with that sort of sarcasm. Now, I don't, nece don't know necessarily if that's it, but I was wondering if you could maybe read that poem for us. Sure. And, and just maybe give a little hint, not the whole thing, but into what you were thinking, because that one was the first thing. It just grabbed me and I just couldn't. Sure, yeah. It is resume, so... <laughs> but of course resume is there i almost thought should i put up the little accent you know that sometimes people put but i wanted that kind of second meaning but definitely it's a it's a resume resume where the train once rained through town like a river where the water rose in early summer and froze come winter where the moon of the outhouse shone its crescent welcome where the heavens opened and the sun wouldn't quit past the gully or gulch or holler or ditch. I was born or torn. Dragged myself atop this mountain fueled by flour, buttermilk, grease fires. Where I'm from, women speak in burnt tongues and someone's daddy dug a latrine so deep up from the dark, dank bottom springs a tree. <laughs> Just, just fantastic! Oh my god! Uh, and 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 was I was I getting close to where where you're trying to do for your your because it's it's the very first thing you see. I think it's a little bit uh, about myth, and you can mm -hmm. take that and uh, however you want. I mean, it, it's about creating myth. It's also about sort of what where this eye is from, which is 
sort of me, but sort of also a we, uh, a W-E. And, and I think often sort of the blues tradition I found myself fortunate to be in, I think that's common. Like I'm, you know, people say, you know, uh, you know, I was born, John Henry's born with a steel hammer in his hand. And this person is saying they were born, you know, past the gully or gulch or ditch. I was also, I think, in love with this kind of language of how we call things. And, um, but also this kind of rootedness, this uh, growing up out of nothing or uh, excess or, or something like that uh, to survive and bloom. I think that was part of what I was interested in. And so of all the eyes in the, the book, that's probably the least autobiographical in, in some sense, but I also think that's important. Um, you know, it kind of also says, you know, these poems aren't gonna only be walking and talking uh, on Tuesday. They're also interested in these kind of mythic big things. And the stones are literal, I think, but the stones are symbolic in the rest of the book. Um, I also want something sort of green and out of the muck and, and, and mud, um, which sort of stones both are and aren't, you know, they, they're natural, but we craft them in these ways as gravestones. But I think you saw in that poem, Sandy Road, where the stones sort of migrate, but never far in a way that's um, part of some of the family in the book, you know, um, there's something solid and, and powerful about it. Um, that I think is really worth remembering. It's a great question. Thank you. I just a great answer. I just <laughs> just wow. Uh, and then we we kind of had something along those lines, didn't we? With talking about his how the repeating themes, right? Yeah, I think so. And also, we had a couple of discussion groups of your poems here, Kevin. We've had a chance to have people talk about them. Um, I have a question for you about sound. Um, so I, the amount of internal rhyme in your poems, the slant rhyme, the, um, the use of enjambment to create a kind of pattern and rhythm mm -hmm. reminds me very much of the bass line in great mm -hmm. jazz. Like, I feel like there's a kind of baseline quality to a lot of your work. Um, and then, but I wanted to ask you about how you think about rhyme. Yeah. I mean, I think, I wish I was always as aware of it as it comes. You know, in some ways, I think um, I always had internal rhyme. I always loved slant rhyme. It's probably how I hear the music of the poem, but also the music of how people speak. Um, I think when I started writing uh, in poems that explicitly thought about the blues, um, they have to have some kind of musicality and, and rhyme is one way in English poetry that we do that. Um, and I'm more interested in that, I suppose, than, than meter or strictly speaking, but I'm really interested in rhythm. And so, uh, I studied with a, a poet named Denise Levertov, who's really tremendous. And if you don't know her work, you should uh, read it right away. Um, well, maybe in like 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that is really wonderful how she used to say to us, um, you know, the page is a score. And th that's how the reader knows how to conduct the poem. The reader was a conductor in her formulation. And she writes about this in essays on the line, um, which are really powerful. But she also, I think, um, it helped me think, oh, well, maybe my music is a little different. Maybe that score is necessarily different. And so it has to have, for me, that enjambment or that turning of the line, which stops in the middle instead of ending, you know, in traditional verse, it would just end at the end or the rhythm, the meter would. And that kind of carrying over is much more how I hear music. And I mean the music of language and the, the music of jazz and other uh, Black music which influenced so much. And so for me, you know, in a way, blues is the baseline, you know, that I am always moving from, but sometimes it's more spoken blues, sometimes it's more sung, um, you know, in, in a poem like um, Dog Tags, where my mother speaks, I mean, I feel like what she says is so much, so poetic anyway, you know, and, and, and so heartbreaking. 
um, I had to just get it right, you know, and that is almost the music that I'm trying to capture, uh, and kind of create a space where that music is the ideal and you're, you're, you know, the poem hopes to be as good as, as what she says. Um, but I am aware of it more and more. And, you know, certainly uh, I love that aspect of, of sound. And um, I think in Stones, I especially was interested in the kind of um, rhyme of imagery. So that imagery comes back and, and, and connects. Uh, you heard a lot of names and obviously Stones. I remember there was a time I was trying to think of what else to call it, but it would have seemed weird to call it something else because <laughs> there's so many Stones in it. There's so much... Um, uh, of that imagery on purpose to, and I really was trying to create something that had that feel of a place where the images were both static and moving. You know, my family's homes in Louisiana are, are often, they feel so familiar, but also are new. And so like, you know, the fireflies or the lightning bugs, however you think of them, those kind of reappear as do the mason jars. And some of that Im imagery um, was taken from the place, but also I think taken from the way that the images almost are like fireflies. They appear and disappear and, and float. And if you try to capture them too tight, they're, they're gonna perish, you know? So it's, you have to really balance out that. And it's so similar with the rhyme. Thank you so much for that. Um, we, we can ask a couple more questions, but I want to make sure we leave room also for sure. um, members of the community to post questions. And so all you need to do is put a question in, um, through the Q and A and then Miles or I will read it. Great. Um, so I have a question about, uh, I thought maybe if you could just riff on a word. So one of the other things in your in particularly in stones and then also in brown is that um, every I'm guessing this is true for earlier work I haven't had a chance to read yet that that you're you'll find a word and you don't just double the meaning <laughs> words that have 17 meanings and then you play sure. them all the way through the poem and I wondered if you could talk about just a so exposure um, I mean just you know I could go through stones and culture sure. Um, you know, uh, blackout, chisel, swallows, they're verbs, they're nouns. Sure. Uh, they're, they're images, they're things. Uh, I wondered if you could, if you could just talk about maybe even some of your favorite words right now. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, sometimes you're, uh, like it, it's hard to, I remember trying to figure out like how to say dawn better, you know, and I ended up with cock crow, which is one word for, you know, dawn or, um, but also that rooster call. And I was trying to describe, really describe how annoying roosters can be. Um, people think of them as charming and, and that they um, crow at dawn. They crow at like four to midnight, you know, whenever they feel and they're quite loud. Um, and so how do you kind of capture that and that feeling? And sometimes I think a lot about what Seamus Heaney, who was one of my old teachers, used to call the um, weather of words. And, and sort of that weather is what I think I'm interested in in those moments and thinking about you know, the blackout is literal, but obviously also it's about, you know, during a blackout going to a bar. Um, so there's that meaning of blackout, but also I think about race and connection and um, it's about fathers and, and loss. Um, uh, what isn't, I suppose. But, you know, for me, like, how do you, you know, you have to, I always love titles because they, they place us, you know, um, it's like in that poem, it said once things didn't have names and you had to wait, you know, and, and I think sometimes a title inspires the poem and sometimes it's the other way around. You, the poem really roots around for a title. Um, and in this book, I really wanted things that were taken from the poem or taken from the moment. Um, and there was a moment I'll tell you, uh, that the poems didn't have titles. They were just all like floating stones. And uh, I think it was my, one of my readers was like, you can't do that. It's just, <laughs> you know, they're, they each have these moments. 
Um, and I think that helped though for me writing it because I thought of it as one kind of suite of things. And now I don't as much um, having named them and separate them. But I think it was it was like that poem, the things just, the poems needed time to find what their names were. Um, I guess this is this is sort of a follow-up question um, to sort of finding, you sure. know, fi trying to find um, where you are, you know, the poems finding who and what they are. And, and one of the things that I guess in comparison, maybe this is just me right now, but I read Stones and I also read through Brown. Um, and Brown compared to Stones is a little bit more heavier, I'd say, but also mm -hmm. sometimes lighter in different areas. Sure. Um, but I guess my question is, you know, as someone that's, you know, I just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of like City in particular, but who's gone through certain scenarios um, um, that weren't awesome. You know, is it okay to one, not know where you're going, both as a poet um, and as an individual? And do you find yourself really delving into um, those ideas um, when you're writing your poems, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, of course, it's okay. Uh, you know, m much of our lives are spent in, you know, if we're lucky in contentedness, but sometimes in searching for, if not meaning, then sort of uh, something beyond the everyday. And what I love about poetry is the way it makes the extraordinary ordinary and the ordinary extraordinary. It recognizes, as the poem says in Stones, most miracles be small, you know, miracles are kind of, you know, I think we think of them sometimes as these grand, huge things. And sometimes the things that inspire you or save your life are, are little teeny things. Um, it, those two books are, you know, in a way, I think of them as kind of companion pieces. Um, I'm not sure I wrote them that way, but um, the forms at times kind of echo each other. Uh, they each have this kind of step down line in large parts of them. They're in tercets. Um, and so just formally that happened. But also I was writing Brown at a really particular time and it became a very public book. Uh, there was a time when there were public poems and, and kind of private poems. And the job of that book, I think, was to mix those up together. Um, and I was thinking about brownness in, in all senses, but I was thinking about James Brown. I was thinking about also uh, Brown v. Board because I grew up in part in Topeka, Kansas. And um, Linda Brown of Brown v. Board, the little girl at the symbolic heart of that case, uh, played piano in my church and um, sang and was someone I knew and grew up with. Grew up having, you know, history, you know, 20 feet away, which was really powerful. And at the time, I was also, I didn't know when I was writing it, but I had just started at the Schomburg Center, which is a, a you know, research library in New York in Harlem. It's almost 100 years old and has been thinking about these kinds of things for a long time. And it just happened at the same time I was. And so, you know, there's poems about uh, some of my heroes like Arthur Ashe and Hank Aaron. Um, and then there's other poems that are about playing baseball and an all black baseball team and um, them deciding not to give us our trophies when we won. And, you know, uh, sort of bits of the kind of racism that I think people were starting to explicitly talk about it. And there's also poems about, you know, the kind of violence that, uh, especially when you have a young black uh, boy, you worry about. Um, and see, it was kind of a double me remembering my childhood and seeing his and trying to think about those kinds of, you know, acts of racism that I faced that seemed like they'd be different, but that, you know, were all too common and in the news. And so it was, it was a really particular moment for that book, I suppose. Um, but I was also writing these private poems. And one of the things I did in the back of Stones is really list sort of all the times I worked on the book. Uh, and I think it started in 2008. Um, so, you know, books take time, um, which is good, uh, I think, because they accumulate a kind of power uh, over that time. And it, in some ways, by writing a, a book of, of praise or a contemplation about loss and the loss of my father who died uh, young and he was 61 and in an accident and it was kind of sudden and horrible and um but also by now is something i'm trying to return to you know and think about and that book i think stones is very much a book of returning of coming back to louisiana um 
but I'm always interested, I think, in the public and the private history and how those things intersect. And usually I think I'm writing a public book and it's deeply private and I'm writing a public book and it's deep uh, uh, and I'm writing a private book and it becomes a really public one. So, you know, some of that is, is what happens afterwards, but while you're doing it, you have to just be focused on getting it out, I think, and getting it right. Miles, do you mind if I jump in with another question? Oh, go right ahead. I'm, I have to digest that. That was a lot. <laughs> so do I. Jeez. I was just asking these great Get, questions. Getting to, the, getting to the deep stuff here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I want to stay in the deep stuff. And I also um, I have a question about concept albums. Do you ever think about sure. your books as like concept albums or how do you think about how they come together? I mean, you've just started to talk about that actually, like how. Sure. How you think about stones and also brown, and I, I wondered if you can just maybe give some insight to other poets in the group about you know how yeah. you think about a book and how it's growing. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I think back to the, my first few books, my first book was called Most Way Home, and it was very much about Louisiana. Um, and you know, you don't pick your themes; they're they're given to you or thrust upon you, and. Um, you know, you have to find in them what's yours. And for me, it was almost like deciding to write about Louisiana instead of other things and about the mud and the dirt and was a way of saying that's what poetry is. And I'd never seen my grandmother in a book. Um, and now I've dedicated a book to her, you know, and so to have her in a, in a, in that uh, was really powerful for me. Um, and I realized now it was writing about a way of life that my parents lived in the segregated South, but also sort of had their own, uh, grew what they ate and, and had their own sort of farms and, and lives. And I realized I was also writing about sort of this world that was disappearing. And then I started writing poems and I think I thought I'd write a couple and I ended up writing a, a, a huge book about Jean-Michel Basquiat. And that was a book called To Repel Ghosts. And I very much was um, trying to figure out how to capture him, but also this history that he painted and uh, uh, drew about and, and wrote, you know, lines from. And at the time, people would often say, like, why are you writing about him? He's totally ridiculous, irrelevant. People would just be so crazy mean. And now it's like I, I was, you know, prescient somehow. If only I could have afforded a drawing or two, I, I would have been right in other ways. But, um, you know, what happened there is I was just writing and writing. And then suddenly I was like, I can't contain this thing. It's it's messy. And um, what I stumbled upon, funny enough, was a double album. And so I ended up calling it a double album. And um, that kind of format, you know, Prince's 1999 or Bruce Springsteen's uh, early records, which had that quality, were, were things that definitely occurred to me and the way that just a, a album could open up and up and up and you, it's not all you know uh hit singles you have to have kind of album tracks and so that's what it seemed like and uh, that language of albums from hits to tracks to singles to all that uh was all through the book and its structure and it really helped me to think of it musically and then my third book uh which again i was writing this kind of public basket book which was about jack johnson and uh, uh, Lady Day and, and Charlie Parker, the figures that Basquiat painted and loved that also were kind of indicative of his uh, life, short, too short life, um, his genius, but also his sort of tragic end was, was what I was trying to do. And then I was writing these personal poems that became a book called Jelly Roll of Blues. Um, and those were um, personal, but not autobiographical. And that's what the blues taught me is, is there's a way to make a poem that it, like in the blues where you're singing about heartbreak, but you're not like talking about Tuesday and the day you went there. But instead, you know, Robert Johnson sings, I went down to the station with my suitcase in my hand. And, you know, he's, he's not talking about what he had for breakfast. He's telling you the important information and the important information is ominous and loaded. And that suitcase is everything, you know, and, and just that, that moment, that moment of almost hesitation that he's describing, that instance, he's picked the middle of the story to tell us, you know, he doesn't say, by the way, me and my woman have been having this trouble and I'm going to tell you all about it. He's like, I went down to the station with my suitcase in my hand, 
you know, and we know that there's heartbreak in that suitcase or to come. And so I was trying to write about uh, that. And um, all those were kind of different kinds of music, but definitely that double album quite explicitly was part of Two Repel Ghosts. Um, but all those books in different ways, those first few books, all the way to Book of Hours are selected in my selected poems, Blue Laws. Um, so uh, thank you for mentioning that too. And just the number of books that you've published is astonishing. And the books you've, you know, the anthologies are so important. Really, I love what you said in The Art of Losing, which was you couldn't believe that there wasn't this book already on the shelf. And that's how I feel about all of your anthologies. Okay. And, yeah, you, you, you stitched in the missing part. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, I think we have some questions from the audience. Um, and uh, Ann Stachura is there to ask them. Great. Hey, thank you. Uh, we have some great questions. And remember that there will be another Q&A, so you can keep sending them in now, and we'll collect them for later. Uh, but our first question here is from a student. Uh, she said, or he, they say, perhaps this is an aspect of blues that I'm just not aware of, but what connection do you have to nature that brings so much imagery of it into your poems? It's a great question. Uh, yes, I believe that um, the blues are interested in nature, but I obviously was uh, in this recent book. I, you know, I think nature can be really a big solace in times of grief. Um, it was for me and has been for me. But it's also that natural world of Louisiana, which like I said, changes, but doesn't change. Um, it's a very lush place. Um, it's a place where, you know, a building can get taken over by ivy and, and uh, foliage and you see the natural world and it feels, and certainly for generations, uh, we lived by the seasons. I mean, for eons, uh, we all did. And so um, that's part of what I was trying to write about, I think. Um, I wouldn't put it as a kind of echo poetics, but there is some of that in there. I was really trying to think about that natural world and what enlivens me and us. Um, but also in the blues, there's absolutely this tradition of writing about the river or the valley and, and Black uh, music more generally. And how do you think about the mountaintop? How do you, you know, and it's never just a mountaintop in the blues or the gospel tradition. And so for me, I was um, aware of that. And it's something I've written about in a book called The Gray Album. I wrote a little bit about what I call the blues correlative and the way this, that, you know, the train or the river or uh, the valley, all these things uh, become uh, sim not more than a symbol, but a correlative to these feelings. Um, and when you draw upon a river, you're automatically thinking about that river of song that came before that includes, uh, you know, the River Jordan, uh, the spirituals, ways of crossing the river, which meant freedom, quite literally. Um, and then also when Bessie Smith's singing of the river uh, flooding, she's thinking about actual natural disasters. And, you know, we could even go so far as to say environmental racism and things like that. So there's a way in which just by talking about the river, you're tapping into this landscape of imagery that I think is really important. I also just, you know, clearly love fireflies. So I have to, you know, get them in there somewhere. Great, thank you. A professional staff member asks, well, says, I enjoyed your readings. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. And um, wants to know who are some of your favorite poets and how did their work influence your own? Well, I mentioned Langston Hughes. Um, he's a poet who um, I read, I think, but I don't know if I knew enough about when I was younger and wish I had younger. Might have saved me some time and energy because I didn't grow up knowing poets, you know, living poets. And while he was long gone, uh, by the time I was around or, or gone somewhat, he was also everywhere, especially because I lived in Kansas where he had lived as a young person. Um, and so that knowing more about that and his Kansas connection has really been important to me, but also the way he wrote, the way he thought about the blues and turned it into poetry, uh, not to give it the nobleness, nobleness of poetry, but to give poetry, the nobleness of the blues and the complexity, the voices, which also meant writing about everyday folks, um, you know, washerwomen and 
porters and uh, no good folks and and uh, people working hard. You know, he was really great about thinking about the range of black life. And and uh, as he says in his the Negro artist and the racial Mar mountain, he says, you know, we know we are ugly and beautiful. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. And he's really trying to, interested in all aspects. Another poet who happened to have lived in Kansas was Gwendolyn Brooks. She was born in Topeka, uh, obviously lived in Chicago, where I also lived as a kid. And so she was really important to me as a, as a person who was really interested in form, how people spoke, uh, Black women's lives. All that has been really influential. Uh, and the last poet I'll mention is, is Lucille Clifton, uh, who I, always, I read and thought was just tremendous. And then she picked my first book to get published. So I would have never... Um, been here uh, without her. Uh, and then years later, this sort of circle remains unbroken and I ended up um, getting her papers at Emory when I was a curator there. And then after she passed away, um, edited her collected poems. And so in a way, you know, those kind of foundations kind of keep going. And I've, had, I've written introductions to Langston Hughes books, things that, you know, when I was a young poet writing, I could have never imagined. Um, and so, for me, it's it's very much um, amazing to have those kind of inspirations and then to be able to work with them and include them in an anthology like the African American Poetry Anthology I did is is special too. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from another staff member who says, your poems and prose are so very visual. One can visualize the place, the emotions, the people. How do you process what you feel emotionally and make it into a written word? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually a visual person. I, I find this uh, a lot. People want to meet with me or something, you know, at work and they want to talk to me about it. It's like, you need to show me because I'm, I'm actually very visual for a poet. But I think many poets are. We care about what the book looks like. We care about it on the page in a way where arranging things um, visually. And, you know, going back to Denise Levertov, she would say that the visual, the line break, say, is how you hear the poem. So those two things are linked, um, how a poem looks and how it sounds. You see a dense page of long lines or a prose poem. It sounds very different to you um, than, uh, and it is approached differently than uh, the lines I sometimes write, which can be very short. Uh, so, Zoom glitch. Yes, I think we're having a little connection error. Um, Kevin, I hope, can you hear us? I just want to take this moment to thank Kevin for being here at Common Hour today uh, and to remind you all that it's we have 10 minutes to fix this. <laughs> and then Kevin will be back on here with us, continuing the Q&A. Carrie and Miles, I believe, are going to be involved in, in that. So you can keep sending in your questions. And thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you uh, next week at our Common Hour in person. But Kevin, thank you. Sorry about that little glitch at the end. Thank you so much for being here. This is an incredible Common Hour. and. Please stay on as you are available for the Q&A that will begin